the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. A couple of Sundays ago, I was talking with a parishioner after church, and they had a suggestion for me. And uh, they said, you know, it'd be really great if you could put a title in the bulletin of your sermon, because that way it sort of like gives us a nugget to take away, because sometimes there's a lot. Now, that's a great suggestion, and I thought it was interesting because on that Sunday was the first Sunday I had started this new practice with our bulletin. You may have noticed on the front cover, there is an excerpt from one of today's readings, and I've been doing that. Um, I'm working on the bulletin. I've been doing that for the last few Sundays because there's just so much in a worship service. You know, you get four excerpts from the Bible. You have prayers. You get the entirety of Jesus' life and resurrection at the Eucharist. You get hymns at the 10 a.m. And you get this sermon thing. So there is a lot. And I often think the whole enterprise would work a lot better if it was more quality over quantity. And we heard one thing of scripture, said a few prayers, and then all sat together and meditated for 20 minutes. <laughs> And my point in putting forward one verse from our readings is that it could hopefully become an anchor, a touchstone for the week. Because theoretically, the scripture we hear on Sunday is kind of like a pair of glasses meant to be a lens that we carry with us until we get to the next Sunday. Now, if only I could come up with a catchy title for my sermons in time for when our bulletins are printed. That was actually something a a mentor encouraged us to do. Every sermon should have a title, he said, because it helps you stick to the point. My sermons are never done by Thursday, so that's just not going to happen. However, I do have one for you today. A ripe tomato. (laughs) Now, yesterday was like a taste of early summer, wasn't it? It was amazing, so glorious. So beautiful, these breaks in the cold weather with sunshine. And we all know how much better tomatoes are in the summer, right? I don't even buy tomatoes except in a can in the winter because what's the point? They don't seem to have any taste when I get them at the grocery store. They're mealy sometimes, they're like plastic, they're just bland. But in the summer, when I can go to a farmer's market or a fruit and vegetable stand, when you're getting them almost direct from the farm or when a neighbor has grown some and lets me have one or two, that is a whole different story. Their flavor is so rich, you could eat them plain, or a little bit of salt, a little bit of mozzarella and olive oil. Oh my gosh, so good. So think of that perfect tomato. And if you don't like tomatoes, think of your favorite fruit when it is in, because it has reached freshest flavor. That idea is the essence of Jesus' takeaway at the end of chapter 5. The heart of all his teachings in Matthew's gospel that he says in this one phrase, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. However, I I think we hear that in a very particular way. Perfectionists that many of us are, we hear this phrase heaped on as one final impossible task atop this burdensome list of rules that Jesus has been going through. Not just in our gospel, but in Leviticus and also a little bit in Paul. So which one from this morning is just the most challenging for you right now? Don't lie, don't swear, don't show partiality, don't hold a grudge. He's got a grudge going on right here, right now. Come on, I know, I got got them too. Don't seek vengeance. Go the extra mile for someone else. Love your enemies. There is usually for me a handful of these that I'm struggling with on any given day. And some of the time I hear them and maybe like you think it's all just sheer nonsense. And that's why Jesus is Jesus and I'm just me. Because being perfect is totally impossible. That critical perfectionist voice that runs constantly in many of our heads, that is not the voice of God berating you for not living up to whatever standards have been inculcated in you from your beginnings because of your culture or family or where you grew up. Nor is the voice of the Lord the internal voice that is constantly critically appraising others. 
that voice of judgment that displaces our uncomfortable feelings of failure or anxiety on someone else, what we also call blame. Perfection in the way we tend to think of it is simply not what Jesus is referring to. And our English needs a summer tomato. Because what Jesus is calling for is for us to be mature, ripened believers, faith-filled people who engage every day, living with our whole hearts, our whole souls, our whole body, mind, and strength with this commitment to God's creation and all the people. We all know that loving the people like us is really easy. And that's why we tend to surround ourselves with people like us, the ones we hold much in common with. So God asks that we find ways to stretch and grow and develop so that we can tap into the holy within us as God sees. This God who has the rainfall and the sunshine on all of us imperfect people throughout the world. But this way of living is so very hard, yes? Loving enemies, forgiveness, compassion, it is not easy. So we are to remember we are part of a vine. We are connected to something much larger. And this gospel and each of our readings except the psalm, they are not directed to you and me. They are directed to us and we. I often share when I'm doing Bible study um, here at the church or anywhere to, to try and train our brains that when we hear Jesus say you, we immediately take it personally. But nine times out of 10, he's saying y'all. Y'all is the way my Greek professor taught me to remember it. Jesus rarely says you to one particular person. Most often he is speaking with the disciples or the crowds or all groups brought together as he is this morning. And the same is actually true of this reading from Leviticus. They are both ways of living for a community of people, a people who believe that God has liberated them, forgiven them, freed them, loved them, and who believe that the only way they could possibly live into their end of that holy covenant is through community and working together. Through community, we become aware of this God-given holiness and our need for one another. You know, sometimes our choir will sing a piece of music, and this is true in all choral music, it's written in such a way where a soprano note may be held for bars and bars and bars and bars. No one soprano could do that, but when each just falls out, comes back in, takes a breath, together they can create this beautiful line of music. So, if there's something in this morning's guidelines from Leviticus or from the gospel or from Paul that you find particularly challenging, I would encourage you to consider the community ministries of this. Now, two weeks ago, I was on Facebook and I saw a post from Van Gardner. Now, Van Gardner is the priest down at St. Luke's, Cary Street, Franklin Square neighborhood, relatively close to Sandtown. Now, if you don't know, we've, we've been in a growing, maturing relationships with St. Luke's downtown, and it all started about four years ago. He invited myself and a few other rectors from um, some county congregations to come and hear about the work he was doing, because the, the community was going to be closed. They were going to close St. Luke's because they had a very small worshiping community, and they have a gorgeous, giant church that can seat 800 people. But what they were doing there that was thriving was a summer camp for youth and an after-school program for youth that the parishioners were just running single-handedly. And Van said, no, Bishop, please, I'm, I'm in retirement, I'll come, I'll serve, don't close down this space, because this is vital ministry for these kids and for their families. So in the course of these four years, we started out, we, we did, provided food for Camp Imagination, a summer camp. He created a Christmas cafe which as you know, in December, we, we create a whole store down at St. Luke's and then a cafe of food. And it was, it was tremendous. It was our second year in December. And now we're starting a Wednesday after school program and actually considering a mission group that would worship occasionally with St. Luke's while staying members of Good Shepherd. How can we be in a brother, sister, supportive relationship with this community? So the other day, I'm on Facebook, and Van has posted this picture of the youth group. 
And he writes about how volunteers had to escort the youth from school to the church so that they could have their after school program because there were drug dealers a block away and there had just been a shooting incident. So there was a lot of police activity and helicopters and they just wanted to be sure the kids were safe and the kids got there for after school. So in his post, he was both commending and thanking the volunteers who did this. And he was lamenting the fact that this is the daily reality for the children in his congregation. As I thought about whether or not I wanted to share that post on our Good Shepherd page, I didn't because I thought the post would be too scary. And I thought, how am I gonna get volunteers to be in relationship when Van's saying something about a shooting that happens in a place that in some ways is very, very, very far away? I mean, we all know their neighborhood is not like ours. I don't think there's any farmer's markets or fresh food stands where you can get a juicy, ripe tomato. In fact, if you talk to some of the 60 volunteers that have been down there in the course of these couple of years, one of the things that consistently comes up when we serve lunch is vegetables. Why do the kids eat so much vegetables? Why are plates piled high with broccoli when we serve lunch at St. Luke's? I know, and you know, that the children and people of St. Luke's are certainly not our enemies. Do you think it's safe to say that in some ways we could classify that section, that those places as enemy territories? They're places that are scary. I don't, I wouldn't go down there at night. I would probably go down there with another person in community. They're places that feel abandoned. I turned to Hillary when we were leaving the Christmas cafe um, because the minute we drove out of the parking lot, it's like we were in a whole different world. It's like we had left, I see nodding heads because you were there and you know that. We were in this one feeling and we go through and all of a sudden it's, it's a totally... So I think when we get all caught up with our inability to individually live into perfecting ourselves, let's reframe that call of God through Christ and through Moses. And let's hear it as a call of God to a holy community saying, how are you in relationship with the communities around you? the ones who need to glean from your fields, the ones in need of people who will go the extra mile. Because this holiness is present, it is here, it is growing, and we continue to make it shine forth. We continue to become a good, ripe, holy. Now the scripture, as I said, does contain some me statements this morning. It's in our psalm. Our psalm is the prayer of the individual. It is a direct plea to God for understanding God's ways, for help in being good, for guidance and support. That is a good prayer for the individual. But maybe we can hear God answer that prayer somewhat through this call of Christ, this encouragement to work within our community to help our neighboring communities, because those are ways in which we will transform ourselves just as we transform the world around us. Christian life, the spiritual life, it is not about perfecting. It is not about arriving. It is about becoming, always becoming the person God created you and I and us. How are you doing that? How are you adding to the foundation Christ has laid? And in what ways do you hear Jesus challenging and calling you, me, calling us to be this light on a hill, a community that loves our neighbors as we love ourselves?